Is the Bible written by God? And can we trust it as the inerrant, infallible word of God? Can we look to this book and say this is the inerrant word of God? It is trustworthy. I put my full trust and confidence in the book. Is every word of it from God? Can we say without a doubt that every word found in the Scriptures came indeed from God? Could it be that inspiration was lost in translation? That is, if we have confidence in the original manuscripts as being inspired of God, when it's translated then into our language, has, have we lost inspiration so that we no longer have confidence in the Bible being the Word of God? And how could it be from God and yet reflect the vocabulary and the style of the human writers? For example, you see there's a difference in style of Paul and John. There's a difference in vocabulary of Matthew and Luke. Does that suggest that the Bible is not inspired, as some would argue? And does it matter if I believe in verbal inspiration? What if I decide that I just don't really buy into this verbal inspiration, every word came from God, I believe God gave the Bible, but is not verbally inspired. Does that make any difference about me? With those questions in mind that we seek to answer, let's talk about the inspiration of the Bible. Let's talk about the inspiration of the Bible. Why do we need to talk about that? Well, believing that the Bible is the infallible Word of God is fundamental to all Bible study and is the foundation of all Bible preaching. Now, can you imagine the study that you would have of the Bible, this book that you call the Bible, that you call the Word of God, if you did not believe in the Bible as being the infallible Word of God, what difference would that make in your Bible study? Would you look at it and say, well, I like what it says, but I'm not sure I agree with everything. Or would you look at it and say, this is the infallible word of God. I'm going to accept it. I'm going to practice it. Or would you reject portions of that? And see, so you see why that's fundamental to all Bible study. But it's also foundation to all Bible preaching. Why do we start preaching the word of God and telling people what God said and what the Bible says, what the scriptures teach, if it is not the infallible word of God? What difference would all of that make? We're going to raise several questions. Let's start with this. What does inspiration mean? When we talk about inspiration, that may say one thing to one person, and another one may be thinking, I know what that means, and they have an entirely different concept in mind. What is inspiration? Well, inspiration does not refer to the effect that the message has on the recipient. Some think that's what it means. That here is an inspiring message. This is the inspired Word of God. And what they're translating in their mind that to mean, this is an inspiring message. And so this is a great message. It inspires people to be better people. Inspiration does not refer to the effect that the message has on the recipient. Let's turn to 2 Timothy 3.16. We'll look at this several times tonight. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That literally means it's God breathed. A.T. Robertson says that M.R. Vincent, those are not commentators, those are Greek authorities who say that the expression inspiration of God literally means, it's a compound word from the word that means spirit uh, or breath, and the idea of God. So it's God breathed. It literally gives the idea that God breathed the scriptures. Now that doesn't mean God breathed into the scriptures. That is, taking the words of man and then giving his stamp of approval to them. In other words, man doesn't write what man decides to write. And God breathes into that, meaning God gives his stamp of approval to that. But rather it's the idea, not of God breathing into, but God breathing out. It is the idea that the words came from God. 
So whatever Paul writes, whatever John writes, whatever Matthew writes was breathed out by God. So we're trying to define inspiration. It literally means God breathed. That God breathed these words out. These words came from God. It refers to God giving the very words of the Bible message. Now we'll look at two definitions of the concept of inspiration. One is a direct quotation from Scripture that I think captures in one sentence the idea of what inspiration is. This is a statement from David in 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 and 2. Now these are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, Thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of God, of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. What did David say? David said, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. There's not a better definition of inspiration in all of the scriptures than what David said. What are we talking about when we talk about inspiration of the Scriptures? What David claimed, and that is, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. David said, when I was speaking, that was the Spirit of the Lord speaking by me, and His Word, that is the Spirit of the Lord's Word, was on my tongue. That is an affirmation that God inspired him, and God inspired every word that he said. Let's go further and look at B.B. Warfield. You don't read very much on inspiration without coming across the work of Benjamin Warfield. Warfield said in the definition concerning inspiration, it is the supernatural influence exerted on the sacred writers by the Spirit of God by virtue of which their writings are given divine trustworthiness. I want to read that again and let's go back to 2 Samuel and compare that. Warfield is saying, and Warfield is right about this, not because Warfield said it, but because he's reflecting on what the scriptures actually taught. The supernatural influence exerted on the sacred writers by the Spirit of God by virtue of which their writings are given divine trustworthiness. Compare that with what David said, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. That's exactly what David said. It is that influence of the Holy Spirit upon the sacred writers that gives their writings divine trustworthiness. Now let's raise a second question. What does the Bible claim? We don't even need to talk about inspiration of the scriptures if the Bible makes no claim of that. So if we can search through the Bible and say, you know, it really never claims it's from God, then we just forget about the question because we don't need to pursue that question. So does the Bible make the claim? And that's important toward when we get toward the end of our study. So you might be saying, well, you know, I already know the Bible claims that. We don't even need to look at those passages. I understand the Bible claims that. I want you to see how often the Bible claims that it is inspired of God. And we'll make a point about that at the end of our study. The expression, thus saith the Lord, or its equivalent, is found some 2,000 times plus scattered through the Bible. The expression, thus saith the Lord, is found 414 times. God said is found 46 times. And the Lord said some 221 times in the New King James translation. So here we have this, these expressions, or the King James rather, in where God is simply saying, or the text is saying, thus saith the Lord. God said. The Lord said. So the claim is over 2,000 times. The claim is God wrote these words. Now let's look at the Old Testament claim. And I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit because I just want you to get the flavor of how many places where this was said. And we're going to then slow down and focus on some other principles a little bit later. Let's talk about how the men of God claimed to speak as they were directed by the Spirit of God. Let's take, for example, David. I quickly mentioned this again because David said the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. In Matthew chapter 22... The Lord said, how then does David in the Spirit call him Lord? You see, Jesus said David was speaking by the influence of the Spirit. So the Old Testament writers claim we are speaking by the Spirit of God. Here is what Isaiah said. Notice the underlined portion without reading every word of the quotations before you. Isaiah claimed, for the Lord has spoken. So Isaiah was saying, what I'm teaching and what I'm preaching came from the Lord. Well, Jeremiah did the same thing. Jeremiah 1 and verse 4, the word of the Lord came to me, saying. 
Drop down to verse 7. And whatever I command you, you shall speak, God said to Jeremiah. Then verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Isaiah said, David said, We're speaking by inspiration. Jeremiah said, We're speaking by inspiration. Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel said the word of the Lord came, or the text says, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel. Zechariah made the same claim. Zechariah 7 and in verse 12, Zechariah said that yes, they made their hearts like flint, refusing to hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by His Spirit through the former prophets. So Zechariah was saying there were other prophets who were inspired of God. Not just a claim about himself, but there were others. Now I want to suggest to you the New Testament, we're still talking about the Old Testament claim, but the New Testament said the Old Testament was inspired. In other words, we come to the New Testament, and it points back to the Old Testament and says it was inspired. Here's what Peter said, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So Peter said, when the Old Testament writers were writing, they were moved or borne along by the Holy Spirit. Now time would fail us to notice every one of these passages, but what I want you to notice here is on the one side we have what the Scriptures actually said, but over here when they are quoted in the New Testament, it tells us that God said that. So the Scriptures recorded, for example, uh, like Genesis 2.24, that man should not be alone and that uh, that God just said that there would be one flesh, no more one, but uh, joined, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Now when the text quotes that in Matthew, it says God had said that. Well, we see the same thing all the way down from Hebrews 1, quoting from Psalm 104, or quoting from Isaiah 55, or Psalm 16, or Psalm 2. The text will say God said that, but it was actually recorded in Scripture. That is a claim that Genesis and Psalm and Isaiah and Deuteronomy were indeed written by God. Now let's talk about the New Testament claim. So I know the Old Testament writers claim we were speaking by the direction and inspiration of God. What did the New Testament writers claim? <clears throat> well, Jesus spoke of the authority of the Scriptures. Let's look at John 10, 35. Turn with me to John chapter 10 and verse 35. That he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the Scripture cannot be broken. Here Jesus quotes from Psalm 82 and in verse 6. He calls it law in verse 34, and he calls it scripture in verse 35. Jesus said that the law cannot be broken, or the scripture cannot be broken. It does not mean the scripture cannot be violated, but what he's saying is it cannot be loosed or undone. That here is a passage in Psalm 82 that cannot be loosed, nor can it be undone. So Jesus is giving an affirmation of the authority of the Scripture, and the Scripture he refers to is Psalm 82 and verse 6. B.B. Warfield said that if the most casual statement of the Old Testament is authoritative, then so is all the rest. In other words, here is a statement in Psalm 82 that seems to be kind of obscure, or it seems to be kind of a minor text, with not great emphasis like Genesis chapter 3 or Genesis 2, but here is this passage that seems to be a minor passage, and Jesus says it has authority, it cannot be loosed or undone, then so is all the rest. Jesus is endorsing the Old Testament. Let's go to Matthew 5 and in verse 18. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. No, jot is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The tittle is the projection of a letter to distinguish it from another, like the crossing of the T. And so he says that not one jot nor one tittle would by any means pass till all is fulfilled. That's like the crossing of the I, or the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T. Here's the point. The scriptures are true and they are reliable down to the smallest of detail. 
It's not that generally the scriptures are trustworthy and reliable, but the details are missing in that. They're reliable down to the smallest of detail. Now I want you to notice with me that the Old Testament is endorsed by Jesus. In other words, I want you to notice that Jesus believed what was recorded in the Old Testament to be fact and not fiction. Without giving the details, he mentioned the, uh, the story of the creation and gave his endorsement thereof. So Jesus endorsed the creation. He talked about at the beginning God made them male and female. That's what I read in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. So Jesus gave his stamp of approval to that. In Matthew chapter 24, he gave his stamp of approval to the story of Noah and the flood. And talk about the flood coming upon the world of the ungodly. Talks about what they were doing in the days of Noah. They were marrying and giving in marriage. And talks about the flood rushing in upon them. So he gave his endorsement to the story of Noah and the flood. He gave his endorsement to the story of Genesis 19 of Sodom's judgment. And mentions Lot's wife, Luke chapter 17 and in verse 32. Remember Lot's wife. Well, the story was she turned around and became a pillar of thought. Jesus gave his endorsement to that. Furthermore, he gave his endorsement to the story of Jonah and the great fish. In Matthew chapter 12 and in verse 40. So if Jesus endorsed those and the creation story is not really true, the flood really didn't happen, Lot's wife did not become a pillar of salt, and there wasn't really a man swallowed by this giant fish, then Jesus was wrong and we cannot trust him as indeed our infallible Savior. More about that a little bit later. <clears throat> Now, we're still talking about the New Testament claim. Jesus spoke of the authority of the Scriptures. The apostles and New Testament writers claimed, like the Old Testament, we're speaking by the inspiration of God. Now, let's get a sampling of that. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, Paul would say, Now the Spirit expressly says. And then he starts writing. Or continues writing. And what he says is that this is what the Holy Spirit tells me to say. Well, let's look at another sampling. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, Peter calls Paul's writing scripture. In other words, a reference to the writings of God. And so there are some who take the writings of Paul and twist them like they do the rest of the scriptures. He refers to Paul's writing as scripture. Ephesians chapter 3, 3 through 5, the apostles were guided by the Holy Spirit. Take the time with me to turn over to Ephesians chapter 3. This is one of the simplest of passages. Get the concept before us. In Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 3, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Verse 5 which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed by his Spirit to the holy apostles and prophets. So the apostles and prophets, that is New Testament prophets, were guided by the Holy Spirit. Paul said when he came to Thessalonica, he preached a message that was not the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, claimed to be directed by God. Now let's go to John 16. John chapters 14, 15, and 16, actually starting in 13 through 17, is a unit of chapters that deal with Jesus talking to his apostles. And I want you to notice as he talks to them, in chapter 16, he promises the Holy Spirit would come and would guide them. Look at verse 13, into all truth. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit would guide the apostles into all truth. Galatians chapter 1, 11 and 12, Paul said he did not receive his gospel from man but God. That was one of the questions concerning his apostleship. Some were saying he got his, uh, he got his message from man. And that's where he got his credentials. And Paul is saying in Galatians 1, I did not receive my message from man. I received my message indeed from God. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, the command things that I write are the commandments of the Lord. Now, I know we've looked at a lot of passages. What I'm wanting you to do is to get a flavor of the fact that the Bible in multiple places claims we are writing by the direction of God. The Holy Spirit guided me in exactly what to say. Both Old and New Testament writers made that claim. 
Now let's focus on some main passages. If you don't have your Bible out yet, this would be a good time to get it out and make some marginal notes if you don't have them there. And let's talk about some primary passages that deal with inspiration. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We'll come to it time and again. The text says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's talk about the word Scripture. The word Scripture is from the word graphe, which means writings or oracles. Writings or oracles. It would include both the Old and New Testament. And you say, how do you know? Well, same writer now. This is Paul. This is Paul writing to Timothy. And the same writer in 1 Timothy 5.18 uses that same word to refer to both Old and New Testament. Let's see. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 18, he says, For the Scripture says... And here's his first quotation. You shall not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. He said the scripture said that. Where was that found? That found in Deuteronomy 25.4. That's Old Testament. But he's not through. And still talking about the scripture, the labor is worthy of his wages. Where's that found? Luke 10 and in verse 7. That's in the New Testament. So he uses this term scripture to refer to both Old Testament reference and New Testament reference. Now let's go back to 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now we know what scripture means, but he says all scripture. That includes all and leaves none out. That includes both Old Testament and New Testament. So it's not that the Old Testament is inspired, but the New Testament is worthless, or vice versa. The New Testament is inspired, the Old Testament is worthless. But all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Let's talk about the phrase inspired of God or inspiration of God. We've already quoted from Robertson. Vincent says the same thing. It means God breathed, literally God breathed out. Again, that's not the effect that it has on the recipient. But it has to do with where the message came from. It came from God. That's one of the main passages we need to appeal to to talk about inspiration. We're not through. We're coming back a little bit later. Now get your Bible and let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is an important passage to get fixed in your mind as we talk about inspiration. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 beginning at verse 9. I want you to notice that he says at verse 9... As it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. All right, verse 9 said, man did not know the mind of God until it was revealed. That's the point. What's in the mind of God, you didn't know until God revealed that. Now verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. What verse 10 tell me? God has revealed them to us by the Spirit. Now verse 11. Verse 11, for what man knows the things of man except the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. He gives an illustration. No one knows what's on your mind unless you reveal it. If I told you about something, I'm thinking something, you have no way of knowing what I'm thinking until I reveal it to you, then you know what I'm thinking. So likewise, it's true with reference to the revelation of God. Now, 12 and 13. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is of God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Verse 13. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual Verse 12 and 13 simply say that this revelation was spoken in words, not of man's wisdom, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. So notice again verse 13, not in words. We're coming back to this passage later. You might circle or underline the word words. Not which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. So this passage teaches that the words were chosen by the Holy Spirit. An affirmation of verbal inspiration. Here's a third main passage, primary passage we want to consider. 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21. 
We quoted it earlier. Let's look a little more in detail. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What is this text telling me? That prophecy did not owe its origin to man. That's what it means by private interpretation. You say, how do you know that's what that phrase of private interpretation means? I know that because of this word in verse 21, this word for. Here's an explanation. For prophecy never came by the will of man. There's his explanation of that. So prophecy did not owe its origin to man. Prophecy had its origin from God. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to notice that he talks here about the use of instrumentality of human authors. God could have taken his word as he wrote upon the tables of stone and miraculously wrote it upon a book without the use of human instrumentality and recorded his will. He could have done that. But that's not what he did. Notice this text talks about the use of the instrumentality of human authors. That these holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now what does the word move suggest? It suggests that they were borne along as a ship is moved by the wind. As the ship is moved along by the wind, so likewise these men were moved or borne along by the Spirit of God. In other words, they were moved by the power of the Holy Spirit in writing and in saying what they said. So the Scriptures does not owe itself to the origin of man. It owes itself to the origin of God. But what about the humans that were involved? They were moved as they were, or they wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So that affirms the idea of inspiration. Now let's get a little more detail. And this is one of the more important sections of our study tonight. To what degree is it inspired? To what degree is the Bible inspired? Most religious people would say something to the effect that the Bible is from God. And so they'd be in agreement with us to that point. But the question comes to what degree is it inspired of God? Well, let's first of all suggest that all of it is inspired. That's what we call plenary or plenary inspiration. All of it is inspired. There are some who think the Old Testament is inspired, but the New Testament is not. The Orthodox Jew might think that. There are some who think, for example, Matthew and Mark and Luke and John is inspired, and writings of Paul is inspired, but James is not inspired. The book of James is not. But all of it is. 2 Timothy 3.16, we're going to hit these passages quickly because we've looked at them already in detail. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Not some, but all of it. We noted in 2 Peter chapter 1, what is said of one prophet is true of all the prophets. They were all moved and borne along by the Holy Spirit. That would include both Old and New Testament. All of it is inspired. That means one writer is just as inspired as another. So when I read from Matthew, that he's inspired. But I want to read from James, he's also inspired. And when I read from Isaiah, he's also inspired. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. But let's go a step further. And this is where we want to pay close attention. Every word is inspired. That's what we call verbal inspiration. This is now where the separation begins to come. What I mean by separation, many of the people in the world would say, well, I think the Bible is inspired. I think God was behind the Bible. But they do not believe, in fact, few people in the religious world believe, even some of our own brethren deny verbal inspiration. Now stop and think about that. Some of our own so-called brethren deny the verbal inspiration of the scriptures. In other words, every word is not inspired of God. Now let's go back to 2 Timothy 3.16. This passage is not always presented as a passage affirming that. Some think, well, this affirms all scripture, is in, uh, all the Bible is inspired, but it doesn't tell us every word is inspired. Let's go back and see if it does. The text says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Scripture, graphe, writings, 
The writing is thoughts expressed in words. You get the picture. The scripture, that's writings. Writings are thoughts that are expressed in words. That's what writings are. So if the scripture is inspired of God, then the words are inspired of God. All writings by inspired men is inspired of God. This passage not only affirms all of the Bible is inspired, but it is affirming even the words are inspired of God. Not just the thought, but the words. This passage is not so much about how the word came to us, but where it came from. It was God breathed. So all writings, thoughts that are put in words, were breathed by God. That's an affirmation of verbal inspiration. But here's another. We've already noted 1 Corinthians 2.13. If you don't have this mark, go back and notice in 1 Corinthians 2.13, the words were chosen by the Holy Spirit. Notice what the text says. These things we also speak not in words. That's how thoughts are communicated is through words. Not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Who chose the words that communicate the thoughts of God? Not man, but the Holy Spirit. That is an affirmation of verbal inspiration. But let's go again. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. This is when Jesus is sending out his apostles. Matthew chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. Jesus is sending out his apostles, and he told them that when they would be called into question, not take any thought. Verse 19, do not worry about how or what you shall speak. Notice those two words, what and how. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of the Father who speaks in you. Now what I want you to notice is the Holy Spirit would tell them what to say, but also how to say it. What is the message or the thoughts? How are the words with which they speak? So they didn't have to take thought. They don't have a message here and say, well, now we've got to think how we're going to word this. We've got to think this through so we get the right message across. I have to think that way. But the apostles didn't have to think that way because they were not only told what to say, they were told the very words to use. How and what they shall speak. Let's go again. We've already noticed in Second Peter, Second Samuel twenty three two, the word of the Spirit was on David's tongue. He said, Jeremiah one nineteen. We noted earlier, God put the words in Jeremiah's mouth. That's verbal inspiration. Now I want to go to two passages here in the New Testament, and then we'll draw a conclusion from that. Acts chapter four. God spoke through the Old Testament writers. Now. We've already noted that principle, but I noticed that when the Old Testament was quoted, for example, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 25, that speaking of God, who by the mouth of your servant David said. In other words, David said it, but this came from the mouth of God. God's the one who said it, actually. The same principle is seen in Acts 28 and in verse 25, where God is given the credit for what the prophet had said. So all of those passages affirm verbal inspiration. Now, if the Bible is not verbally inspired, then it is not from God at all. Let that sink in for a moment. If the Bible is not verbally inspired, it's not from God at all. Any more than if I took the concepts and I decide I'm going to write the concepts that are found in the Bible and I'm going to write it down in my words that I can say this is the Word of God. You say, well, I don't know if I'd say that's the Word of God because you might not have given the right impression of what God was wanting to... You might have missed it. Well, that's exactly the thought that is involved if the Bible is not verbally inspired. God had men to write it, but write it in their own words without God choosing the very words. They could have mis- mis- mismanaged that. And we're going to see more about that here in just a second. Now, let's talk about thought inspiration. What about thought inspiration? 
The idea of thought inspiration is God gives the writer the thought and then man chooses his own words so that when I read that, I say, you know what? The writer got a little excited here and he overstated the case. That really didn't happen that way. There are brethren who tell us that on a multiple uh, subjects from creation to the flood to the well to the serpent. The, 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 this story, we, we can't really, the, the writer kind of overstated, inflated things at times. I want us to talk about thought inspiration, where the message was given, the thought was given, but the words were not given to the writers. So we have every right then to question the words that we say, you know what, I think Paul overstated the case here. I don't really think he was trying to say, and then you quote whatever, and he, that's not really what he was trying to say. So we raise the question, how can we have divine inspiration without divine words? There's the divine thought, but the words are not divine. You see, thoughts are expressed in words. We depend on words to know the thoughts of God. How do I know the thoughts of God? You say, well, here's what God was thinking. Well, how do I know that's what God was thinking if these words didn't come from God? If thought inspiration is true, and that's the only way in which it's inspired, then how can we have divine inspiration without divine words? If we're dependent on fallible human judgment to select words to express God's thoughts, then any instance where judgment errs, we do not have the thoughts of God. I want you to get that point. And then it's not possible to really know what God intended. So in other words, God gave Paul the thought to write about justification by faith, but then Paul makes up the words, and he might have chosen the wrong words. That could have happened. So when I read that, anywhere that Paul may have erred, he's fallible after all, then I don't have the thoughts of God on justification by faith. I don't have the thoughts of God. And I really don't know what God intended on that. I know what Paul said about it, but I don't know what God intended. If the Bible is not inspired in word, then it is not the inspired word of God. Now listen to me carefully. When you have a professor tell you and convinces you the Bible is not inspired in word and you believe that, you have just given up your belief in the inspired word of God. You've given it up. And you've bought into a form of atheism. And when we begin to tell our friends that, and we begin to dish that out, that it's not inspired in word, it's in thought, then we're saying the Bible is not the inspired word of God. If it's not inspired in word, it is not the inspired word of God. If thought inspiration is how the Bible is inspired, we cannot have full confidence in the substance or in the form. What do I mean by that? If thought inspiration is true, I can't have full confidence in the thoughts because I'm not sure what the thoughts were. Because, see, that man may have muddled that. So I can't go to the text and be fully confident that I've got the message or the substance from God, and then I really can't have confidence in the form or the words because man could have muddled that. So not only can I not have confidence in the words, I can't have confidence in the thought because I don't know what the thought was. So let's raise another question. Is the Bible inerrant? Is the Bible inerrant? You've heard me say before, to show you how things have progressed, which means it could happen to any one of us. At David Lipscomb University, which was started by David Lipscomb, a gospel preacher, there is not a Bible professor on staff where did I get my information before I tell you what, what, what's true? I got my information from that, from the editor of the Gospel Advocate, who's on that side of the institutional question. He tells us that there is not a Bible professor on staff at David Lipscomb that believes that the Bible is the inerrant Word of God. In other words, they don't believe in verbal inspiration. Not a single one on staff. Now, that's how far they've gone. It's just a matter of time to others go in that same direction. 
Some of our own non-institutional brethren may begin to buy into that. Some have hinted at that, by the way. So is the Bible inerrant? If the Bible is verbally inspired, it is inerrant. Not only the thoughts were inspired, but the very words, it is the inerrant word of God. Now, some confuse that with saying that everything in the Bible is absolutely true. That doesn't mean everything in the Bible is true. For example, the Bible records the lies of the devil. The record of it is true, but what Satan said is not true. So are there some lies in the Bible? Sure. When, when Satan said, you eat of it and you'll not surely die, that was a lie, wasn't it? But the record of that is true. We have the record of false charges in Acts 6. We have the deception recorded in Luke uh, in Joshua 9. And on down the line we could go. We have multiple cases where things that are not true are recorded. The record is true, but those words are not true. The statement may not be true. When we talk about inerrancy of the scriptures, we're talking about the original manuscripts. They are inerrant. More about that in a moment. If history of the Bible is an error, that's really where, where much of this is headed, that the history of the Bible is an error, then how can I be sure of doctrine? In other words, if I go to the Old Testament and say, you know what, I think Genesis 1 is an error. I can't trust that story. I can't trust Genesis 6 to 9, the flood. And I can't trust Jonah. I can't trust those stories. I can't trust that history. How can I trust the doctrine of the Redeemer? How can I? If I can't trust the history. By the way, the bulk of the Old Testament, the heart of the Old Testament and New Testament is based on history. You say, really? You know, what about the history of the resurrection from the dead? Isn't that history? The heart of the New Testament is history. So if I can't trust the history of the Old Testament, can I trust the history of the resurrection? And if I can't trust that, I've done away completely with Christianity. Without reliable scriptures, we cannot have a reliable Savior. If we've taken the scriptures and say it's not reliable, then our Savior is not reliable. We're doing away with our Lord himself. Ron Edwards said it best. He said Always, almost all theologians agree scripture is in some measure God's revelation to the human race. But to allow it to contain errors implies that God mishandled inspiration and has allowed people to be deceived for centuries until modern scholars disentangle the confusion. In short, the, master, the maker muddled the instructions. You think about the implication of that. Because that's what we're being told by some. And that is that God mishandled inspiration and we can't really know what this book is all about till some modern scholars come along and straightened it out and disentangled all of that and explained it all to us. Now we got a, we got a pretty good knowledge of what's going on. But we've been deceived because the maker muddled the instructions. Now I know we're taking some time. Two more things I want us to consider. What kind of evidence could be cited? And don't get excited, we're not going to be here a while, because I'm just going to mention this briefly. I just want to put before you a, 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 a number of uh, things about, uh, let's talk about human element before we talk about the evidence. Let's talk about the human element quickly. What about this human element that's involved? How could the writers be involved? I want to suggest to you that God used the writer's background and vocabulary, and yet could inspire every word. Evidence of that? Matthew and Luke use different terms for the term needle. Remember camel going through an eye of a needle? In Matthew 19, you don't see this in the English. Matthew talks about uh, easy for a camel to go through an eye of a needle, and Luke mentions the same thing, but they use two different words. Matthew uses what I would think of a sewing needle. Why would I think of a sewing needle? I'm not a seamstress, but my mother was. We picked needles up all over the floor, all through the house. Hundreds of needles in the house. So I think of a needle, I think of a seamstress needle, sewing needle. But Luke used a term that was for a suture needle, surgeon's needle. Well, he was a physician. What I'm suggesting to you is inspiration could use the background and the vocabulary of the writer and yet inspire every word. There's over 480 references to medical terms in Luke's writings alone. For example, Luke would give a greater description of things like Peter's mother-in-law had a high fever where Matthew and Mark just simply said she had a fever. 
Luke would talk about one being full of leprosy where Matthew and Mark said they were a leper. So there's the vocabulary. There's personal experiences. 1 Corinthians and Philippians 1. I won't take the time to read because I want to get to another point here in a moment. But there could be the personal experiences where the writer talks about this happened to me at Ephesus or this happened to me as I went on this trip or this happened to me when I uh, was beaten 40 times, for example. Uh, 39 stripes or 40 minus 1. I was beaten. He could talk about personal experiences and yet be recorded by inspiration. Well, is inspiration lost in translation? You say, I understand the original manuscripts were inspired, but now it's been translated into various languages, and now I have the English, and I'm reading the English. So have, can I actually say this is inspired of God? Can I have full confidence in that? The Septuagint translation was made in 285 B.C. of the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek. You say, well, big deal. What's, what's all of that? Well, Jesus used that quotation. And he quoted from it. You say, how do you know? Well, if you ever notice that when Jesus quotes from Isaiah, and then you turn over to Isaiah, it reads just a little bit differently. It's the same message, but the wording's just a little different. So why is that? Because Isaiah, the text Isaiah is translated out of Hebrew. Jesus was quoting from the Septuagint translation. Jesus' quotation will match the Septuagint. The apostles quoted from that. Okay, what's the point? The point is, when they quoted from the Septuagint translation, they attributed the message to the writer, to Isaiah, to the psalmist, or David, or whoever, and attributed it to God. So that means that the writers, Jesus and others, were saying that when I'm reading from this translation, an accurate translation, that is a reflection of the message of God. They attributed the quotes to the writers and to God. That doesn't mean all translations are reliable, though, and we can say more about that at another time. Now, here's where I'm going to take very little time. What kind of evidence can be cited? I want to mention this for those, because people do watch this on YouTube that we have a series on YouTube on evidences for faith. I would encourage you to go to that, to look for these kinds of evidences. I'm not going to spend time on this. What I want you to see is we're not assuming inspiration without saying there's evidence. We could go into archaeology, the scientific foreknowledge of the Scriptures, the unity of the Bible, prophecy and fulfillment, a whole lesson within itself, historical accuracy. There are a number of evidences that could be cited and have been in that series, if you go back to that, that show the Bible indeed is what it claims to be. It is inspired of God. Now, here's the last thing we're going to notice. What difference does it make about inspiration? This is important. Does it really make any difference if I buy into what everybody else seems to believe that the Bible is verbally inspired, that is, brethren, or can I believe what the world believes in thought inspiration and just reject verbal inspiration? What difference does that make anyway? Well, let's consider. If the Bible is verbally inspired, if that's true, and I become convinced that the Bible is verbally inspired, then every part becomes equal. So if James says it, it makes no difference if he or Peter or John or Matthew or Jesus himself quoted from that or is quoted. Because it's all equal. You say, Jesus said it, it's more important than if Paul, not if Paul was writing by inspiration, what Paul said is just as much the word of God as what Jesus uttered. So all parts are equal if I believe in verbal inspiration. It means it's inerrant and it's trustworthy. If the Bible is verbally inspired, it's inerrant and it's trustworthy. I can read it and I can trust it and I can believe it. And furthermore, this is where careful translation is important. We don't lose inspiration in translation because Jesus demonstrated that for us. But could there be some bad translations? There certainly are. Evidence, you can write your own translation. You can make up your own translation, use whatever word you want, and it could be a botched translation. And you could sell it because that's exactly what's been done in a number of cases. And so is that a reliable... No, that's not a reflection of the Word of God at all. There are different thoughts about how you translate. Do you give the gist or do you give the actual meaning of the Word? And so choosing a Bible that you're going to study from, choose a translation very carefully rather than a paraphrase or a loose translation that does not respect inspiration. I want to know something about the translators before I buy a new version. I, I want to know something about their thought about inspiration. Do, do they have respect for that when they translate or did they have no respect for that? It makes a difference about believing in inspiration. 
If the Bible is not verbally inspired, then we begin to deny the literal interpretation of the Bible. The story of the creation, the flood, the story of the serpent. You say that wouldn't happen. That's already happened among us, non-institutional folks. There have been those who denied the creation story. They deny the flood of Genesis. They deny also the serpent is real of Genesis 3. Not real. Didn't happen. It's just kind of a myth. It was thrown into the text. So none of that's true. How long then will it be till we deny the Bible teaching on other subjects? Whether it be the Bible teaching on the virgin birth, Jonah and the well, what it teaches on homosexuality, what it teaches on eternal hell, the miracles of Jesus, salvation and worship. In other words, if I reject creation and the flood, why not also reject what it teaches on homosexuality? Why not reject what it teaches on the virgin birth? Why not reject what it teaches on the resurrection? If I can't trust the Bible as the inerrant word of God, I can't trust what I read in the text. Who's to say how much of it is an error, if not the whole thing? If Genesis 1 is an error, and Jonah is an error, and James, as Martin Luther said, is an error, then why not the whole ball of wax being an error? Listen to this statement carefully and we're done. If the Bible is not what it claims, I said we'd come back to this. It claims to be verbally inspired of God. If it is not what it claims, the Bible is a total fraud. We make that point with Jesus. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And someone said, oh, he was a good man, but he wasn't the Son of God. No, he wasn't. He was a liar. If he's not the Son of God, he lied to us. He's a fraud. He's not a good man. And if the Bible is not what it claims to be, it's a total fraud. It's not a good book. It's a deception. So if we reject the verbal inspiration, we're rejecting the Bible, and it's a total fraud then because it makes the claim that it indeed is inspired of God. Every word of it is inspired of God. We've answered a number of questions. We've had some things we felt needed to talk about. I appreciate you listening carefully, taking extra time. It may be there's one or more present who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come? All together we stand and while we sing.